right, welcome to Game Devs Play Games. Hey guys. We are playing The Curious Expedition. Curious Expedition. This is a game made by uh, Machine and Mensch. We're not German. Sorry, guys. The Machine it, Men. <laughs> it, it's sad because I actually took three, studied three years of German. You took class. three years of German? Yeah, well, Come the, thir on, the third year made me worse at German than I started, so. Ah, gotcha. All right, That's well. what happens when you only listen to David Hasselhoff during your class. <laughs> I kid you not, it was terrible. The Hoff. <laughs> the Hoff is not in this game. Okay, so we're just going to dive right in. Uh, there's a lot to this game. There's a lot of depth, uh, and there's a lot of discovery. The game sort of just drops you in without any real help. And and you can even take the tutorial, but uh, as, as you and I have been talking mm -hmm. before this, um, the tutorial doesn't teach you everything, but almost intentionally yeah. so. Um, it, it leaves the rest of the game mechanics to be explored, which in an exploration game that actually ends up being quite fitting. Yeah, I like it. So uh, we're just going to dive right in. Uh, I'm going to start a new one. Uh, as this is a, a different computer than the one we're used to playing on, we have none of the characters unlocked. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start it with, uh, we have the choice of Charles Darwin, Marie Curie, or Richard Francis Burton. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick Charles Darwin. He's the first one. He's probably the easiest to get through, um, and he's got some of the more advanced mechanics that I can demonstrate. So let us begin. Welcome back to the Explorers Club, old friend. Have you heard that we are building a statue to honor the expeditions of our most famous member? Word is that you have a good chance of seeing your likeness on that statue. However, I am afraid to tell you that you are not the only candidate. You and your rivals have six expeditions to prove who is the most famous explorer within our club. And you can see over here our competition is Harriet Tubman, not an explorer, <laughs> but nobody tell the Germans, uh, Dion Fortune, uh, Alexander David Neal, and Freya Stark. And of all of these, I think these two are are either scientists or mystics or something. There's like, there's very hey man, few actual if, explorers out if, there. If civilization can use Gandhi. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, do, I do like to say, though, I, I would like to point out that of the 16 characters, I think half of them are women, so I think... I think the oh, ladies you're are doing totally quite right. well. Um, no, actually, I mean, even... I think it's eight and The eight. majority of your yeah. competition are all, are, are all women. Or no, oh, yeah. they're all women. They're all women, yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's kind of cool, right? That is awesome. Uh, Freya Stark's one of my favorites, too. I cannot wait to unlock her. So, uh, we choose our next destination as it is the first mission. We only have one choice. It's the Untouched Grasslands. Uh, I wish I had read that. I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, <laughs> so, after a good night's rest, I arrived at the docks. The captain had yet to arrive, so I sat on the pier and waited. A missionary approached me while we waited. He had decided to leave England and begged us to take him to a nearby native village in order to spread the word of God. Yeah, we'll take him along, right? There's no, uh, no real downside there. You know, when I first played this game, I immediately immediately donned the attitude of, I can't trust anybody. This guy is clearly going to backstab me. And, uh, you know, I decided to take him on anyway, because it's the first time I'm playing and I'm already expecting to lose. Oh, for right? sure, yeah. But uh, you quickly find that people are less backstabby in this game than you expect them to be. Initially, until you start feeding them coca leaves, and then they will be super <laughs> backstabby. Yeah, well, we'll get to see that. Right. Uh, I accepted, since I would gladly do my part to help spread the word of God. At last, the ship was ready to be put out to sea. And there's, so there's, there's Sister Ethelene, the the missionary we picked up. There's Aiden McClellan, our Scottish soldier. Uh, Miss Harlow, our donkey. Uh, this is myself, Charles Darwin. Uh, and this is... I'm not even going to try that. So uh, this <laughs> presumably is the Beagle, and let us set sail. You know, one of the cool things about a lot of these characters are that when you're first presented with them, you basically just have to assume what they would do. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it becomes pretty easy to figure out, oh, yeah. out as you, you, you encounter things or you do yeah. expeditions without them. So uh, here we go. This is the uh, this is the interface screen. Uh, the missionary had pinpointed the location of the village he wanted to visit on the map, and this is the overworld. So you can see there's a huge like this this nice tan like old vellum kind of looking thing. It's it's, it's uh, you the know a map of war. yet to be exactly the fog of war is a map yet to be drawn. <laughs> you can see hills kind of poking up uh, where they are and mountains uh, also where they are. Uh, you can't zoom in or out. On, oh no, you can zoom out. Uh, so you can see. Sort of, it's kind of big, uh, but the mountains do tend to ring everything in. So if you find yourself surrounded by mm -hmm. lots of mountains, go in another direction. Uh, what's what? It, what it's showing me there is the amount of sanity, not the number of days it's going to take me to get there. Each hex takes one day to cross through. Uh, mountains are impassable unless you have dynamite. Uh, in my inventory here, I have uh, four chocolate rations. I have three torches for exploring caves. Never go into a cave without a torch. Bad things will happen to you. I've come to find that I don't think caves are very useful to begin with. They um, are. Uh, for one big reason, you can collect mushrooms and water in them when you're in the desert. Okay, that's that's fair. Super crucial. Uh, so this is marked really well clearly right here. There's also two... Uh, so this, this is one of the things that I'm, I'm still sort of... 
gaining insight into is that the game doesn't really do a good job of explaining this. There are these two bars up here. I don't know if you can see them. Uh, that means this map has two regions. Mm -hmm. And right now I've explored about a third of one of them and the natives have no particular feeling about me. Mm -hmm. I'm at standing one, which means it's a little better than nothing, but not much. So I do actually understand a bit of what those bars represent. Okay, go for it. Um, after you explore a certain amount of one of those territories, of which you, there's no way to really differentiate mm -hmm. what territory belongs to what area, uh, mm -hmm. other than like watching those bars grow. Yeah. After you've explored a certain amount, the rest of that region gets um, uncovered for you. Yes, uh, but only if you have, uh, not the geography trait, but there's another perk that you get where the whole region is revealed once you've explored all three locations. Oh. And then um, you actually get a level up point after you've fully explored, uh, or after you've unlocked new regions. So it's not about fully, so to level up your guys, just move as quickly as you can through the level, mm. which is totally counterintuitive to practically every other game out there. Oh, yes. Uh, an important fact to note, you don't actually have to stand in the hex with the village or whatever it is that you're getting into. It took me a while to notice that too. Yeah. but it saves you sanity. It'll save you a little bit of sanity. <laughs> so let's go into the village here. Let's see what they say. Uh, we carefully approached an unknown native village. The people here demanded their respect as they were a shamanistic group. I could smell that they had just prepared food. The villagers kindly waved us over and offered us some of their freshly cooked food. So as you can see, I have a green bar here. Um, I know because it's farther to the right and we are both colorblind. Uh, and so I will just go ahead and take food. Now, if I want to, uh, I could get rid of this basically useless butterfly net and get a few more food. And if I really wanted to, uh, because this cooked animal meat uh, restores, I happen to know that it restores 15 sanity and chocolate only restores 10. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to trade them the rest of my chocolate and have one big stack of meat. And I'm pretty sure... Um... Do, do, does chocolate and meat trade for the same value? Uh, no. Uh, depending or does it actually... on, it depends on a couple of factors. Number one, it depends on your standing. Number mm. two, it depends on who you're trading it to. Uh... Uh, if you're trading chocolate to villagers or to the tradesmen, it'll be worth a lot more than if you're trying to trade it to a slave trader. Mm. Um, if you're trying to do a playthrough where you have a good standing, which is to say the natives like you, don't ever go, don't even talk to the slave traders because that will affect your standing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get that meat. Um, I'm going to deliver the missionary. And it looks like I can rest in the village because I have this Persian translator. Seriously, I'm never going to let him die. He's too useful. I'm going to recruit another donkey so that I can ride one of the donkeys. And I would rest, but I'm full up on sanity. So I'm going to take off. Oh, man. I never knew you could recruit donkeys. Uh, you can recruit donkeys. If there's no one in the village to recruit, they'll sometimes give you either an ox or a donkey. The yeah. ox are actually better, but, you know, I'll take a donkey. Whatever. Yeah, right? Uh, his hooves don't combo with anything. They only deal two damage, but it's better than nothing. And the benefit of riding a donkey is that you get to travel in with the expense of less sanity. Yep. lowered base sanity cost. Um, now, the downside is that you can carry less, but it's you know, generally worth it if you can afford it. It reduces the donkeys. It reduces the animal, no matter what animal it is. Uh, and the animals that you can ride are, well, let's see if I've got this, donkeys, oxen, and I believe you can ride raptors. But that's not till later. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just walked over here onto this hill so I could reveal a little bit more of the map and see where I'm going. And I think that'll take us to the end of the first one. Is that about right? End of the first episode? Yeah. Oh, no, we still got a minute, about two minutes oh. left. Damn, all right. Well, I am just <laughs> terrible at watching the clock then. All right, so we're going to head this way. Um, swamps uh, are what you need rope for. Rope mm -hmm. will help you cross swamps. Uh, machete will get you through jungles and forest. Uh, and climbing gear will get you up hills at base sanity cost, whatever I, that base is. I actually find that climbing gear is probably the most useful out of all of those. Because, Which is why it's the most expensive. Exactly, because you, you burn through rope and, and machete, especially machete. Oh, yeah. I actually like machetes the best um, because when uh, when the woods are on fire and you really have to move <laughs> through them, it's really nice to be able to just cut it down and go. <laughs> yeah, well, especially then the fire can't follow you as so well. So I'm going to explore this elephant graveyard. As you can see, I'm, uh, I'm walking around in here riding on my donkey. Uh, I'm going to search the area. Uh, I told the people to form small teams and investigate the surroundings. After some time, we found valuable elephant tusks. They could be sold for a high price. Oh, yeah, two. Uh, that high price is specifically, uh, they could be sold for 60, mm -hmm. I want to say it's like resources or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you know, 60 money. Money. Uh, it's, it's like a nebulous wealth thing, which is fine. Um, oh, and we've attracted some hungry wildlife. Luckily, it's just hyenas. They've got a 50-50 shot of aggroing us. Uh, if you've got a native warrior in the party, that drops to 25%, um, which oh. is really, really nice. Once something has aggroed you, it will follow you until either your path becomes impassable or they get bored and wander off. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go up and visit this last location here just to seal out the region and maybe get a region point. There we go. Region analyzed. I'm going to go ahead. Now, now, the real decision here is, do I give it to the Scottish soldier 
uh, with the intention of picking oh. up whiskey later because his special ability is he restores more sanity from whiskey than normal. Mm-hmm. Um, or do I give the level up to the Persian translator who increases the sanity gained when I rest in a native village? Well, consider the Persian trader is the one that you're planning on keeping no matter what. I'm planning on keeping the Scottish soldier as well because his combat dice are much more impressive. Actually, I would say, so generally I promote the combat ready people first because you really can benefit from that second row of dice. That is true. Um, I actually didn't realize that that's how you get the promotion points are from getting... analyzing the regions. Yeah, yeah. region analysis is how they, uh, is how they happen. Um, you can bank them at no cost. It doesn't ever penalize you for having mm-hmm. more of them, but it's just nice to have them. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stick with your plan. Let's give it to Aiden McClellan. Um, so when he hits uh, level. Three, three yeah. uh, he'll gain a second row of combat dice. Cultists are really nice because they can get up to three combat rows. They're they're a little gross sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to head down here into the woods, and we are going to go for this shrine. Let's hope it's not a sun, moon, and stars. Because if it is, I'm running. I'm not doing it. You know, shrines, I, I've basically cu- taken the attitude of never really going in them unless ah, rushing I'm, water. I'm, I'm toward the end of the, the game. Rushing water um, is easy. I should have gone back. I keep skipping through all this. All right, in the next one, I promise I'll be better <laughs> about it. Uh, before us lay some kind of ceremonial room. We quietly looked around the majestic hall. Our steps echoed as we approached the sacred altar. Is that treasure on the altar? It is. It is, in fact. <laughs> Let's investigate. Oh, Ooh, oh, oh my God! Okay, so I've, I've successfully never seen this one. I've never seen this before. I've, I've successfully <laughs> done eleven playthroughs, and I've never once encountered this. The Necronomicon, an old heavy leather bound book with metal class by author Abdul Al Azred. A sinister feeling seems to radiate from the book. Return the item home or deliver it at a mission. Okay, some of these items you can use in the overworld. Yeah, I, I want to see what this does. I'm going to take everything. Uh, <laughs> what a glorious day. We secured the treasure. We grabbed what we could and hurried outside as enormous fountains of water broke through the ground and started to flood the whole area. So before, I didn't read it out loud, but there was the sound of rushing water underneath, and that mm-hmm. indicates clearly that there will be like a flood. The floods yeah. are non-lethal, but they can wash you away and take things out of your inventory at random. So so actually, I do want to talk about that mm-hmm. Um I've found that things like, especially the rushing water, yeah. can be extremely detrimental because it can actually cut off your path mm-hmm. and basically make it impossible to win. Not only that, but it can actually also drown out the Golden Pyramid. Yeah. So yeah. if your shrine happens to be near the Golden Pyramid and uh, the water covers the Golden Pyramid, you can't get to it, and then you're stranded, and then you have to use the hot air balloon home. Which, which I don't is... know if we specified, but finding the Golden Pyramid is, is the goal yeah, of the game. right. That's how you get out. Um, th- I, would, I was, I was going to get to that uh, probably by the time we get out. Oh, look, I got another region point. Um, I think I'm going to upgrade McClelland again just to get that second combat row. And it also gives him more health, and it also gives him an extra inventory slot. So now I've got two. Nice. Left click to use. Well, let's save that for the next episode. All right. (laughs) All right. We'll do that next time. All right. Well, uh, yeah, we'll see you in the archives. See you in the archives. I've never seen the Necronomicon. I've never seen it. This is so exciting. I'm so excited.